the fact that light uh, behaves as waves means that uh, we can talk about uh, some of the particular characteristics of those waves have to do with wavelength and frequency and so forth. Uh, and so we'll talk about that in this uh, little lecture today. Uh, <laughs> with that happy thought. So we have uh, electromagnetic waves uh, that travel at this light speed. Okay, uh, that's denoted as C most of the time. And that's in a vacuum, right? Because we remember in a refraction, we talk about index of the fraction, we talk about the speed of light in different materials. So C is the speed of light only in a vacuum. Um, and that means that frequency and wavelength have a nice inverse relationship for EM waves, right? Because we know that the speed of propagation, which here is C, is equal to frequency times wavelength. Uh, we know what that C is as long as we're in a vacuum. And so if we know what frequency is, we can find our wavelength or vice versa. And you get a whole range of um, different types of electromagnetic waves. Uh, and it's really good to note just how huge this range is, right? So here's, here's the world we live in, this visible world that we think of as what is light. And those are about 10 to the negative sixth. Uh, meter wavelengths. Um, gamma rays, that's what this guy is, um, get really, really tiny. Uh, and radio waves are, you know, up here in the kilometer range. Um, and so our frequencies, which are inverse related, range from 10 to the 2 over to 10 to the 22. So just a huge range in frequency and a huge range in wavelength. Uh, and that means that these waves uh, do different things um, and behave uh, in different ways. And we'll talk about that in a minute and in the next coming lectures. Um, let's talk a little bit about that, uh, that visible spectrum, the one we're more familiar with. Um, the visible light spectrum, as we saw on the previous page, is pretty small. Uh, and the color is determined by wavelength or, you know, um, frequency, if we want to think of it that way. Um, the color in an object uh, is seen because the object absorbs all colors that, uh, that it is not. So here we have a blue object. It absorbs every color here except the blue, and so the blue bounces off it. So that's why um, you know a blue car looks blue. Uh, all other waves are going to be absorbed by that blue paint except for uh, the blue waves, and those uh, get reflected to our eyes, and that's what we see. Um, similarly, like a white object um, is going to reflect everything, okay? So if I shine a red light on a white object, it's going to look red, because the only thing bouncing off of it is red. Um, similarly, on the opposite end of the spectrum, a black object absorbs all light, uh, and it appears black. Why do we see colors? Well, we have uh, one of the interesting things about colors is that you can come up with different schemes uh, using three primary colors to make all your other colors. Most of the time we think, oh, what are the primary colors? It's blue, blue red, yellow, uh, but that's not necessarily true. You can actually have a number of different combinations of colors that are your primary colors that can be used to make, uh, make all the other colors. Um, and so our eye actually has uh, Cones that are sensitive to blue, green, and yellow, uh, and out of those different uh, sensitivities, we can recognize an entire range of colors. So light has a color too, right? So if light has a particular wavelength, uh, then it has a, that color of light. Um, and so you can do some interesting stuff, like if I shine a red, pure red light on a blue surface, what happens? Well. If I shine red on blue, uh, the red gets absorbed, and there's no blue to bounce off of it, and so it looks black. Um, I don't know why we have <laughs> I forget why I put potatoes. We'll find out why we get to potatoes. Um, let's see. So uh, an EM wave moves through space. Its electric and magnetic fields are changing, right? We know that. Um, so... That should ring some bells for us, right? When we think about changing magnetic fields and think about electric fields, what does that, what do those do to charges? Well, 
they create forces on those charges, right? So these waves actually have the ability to move charged particles. Uh, and that means that they're going to do work on these particles, right? If you're going to uh, push those particles and uh, add energy to them, then you know that you're doing work to them. And if you're doing work, then you're transferring energy. So an EM wave can add energy to a system. And an example of that, oh, here's the potatoes, uh, is that a microwave uh, can add kinetic energy to the molecules of your potato, right? So you send a bunch of microwaves through that potato. Uh, it starts to vibrate um, the molecules of that potato, uh, and that adds kinetic energy to those molecules. And we know that the kinetic energy of molecules is a, uh, a measure of that is our temperature. And so the temperature of the potato goes up, uh, and its thermal energy goes up. So that's a uh, useful thing. All right, so the energy in a wave E is proportional to its amplitude E naught squared. So that E naught is uh, the max amplitude. So this distance here, right? And so when we have, when that's twice as big, uh, then the energy of the wave uh, is four times as big. Um, we'll get to some more particular uh, uh, formulas for that in a second. Uh, but more importantly than energy, we generally talk about intensity with waves, and intensity is energy per unit time per unit area. So we can write that as energy per unit time per unit area, and we know that energy per time is the same as power, so this ends up being power per area. So what, is that, what does that mean? Why do we want to focus on intensity? Well, think about solar radiation. If we want to know how much energy we're getting from the sun, um, we might pick a certain area, say a meter square, uh, and measure how much uh, energy is transferred to that square in, say, a minute or a second. Um, that's why we want to think about um, the intensity here, because that, that's more practically uh, important to us uh, when we think about a wave, because a wave is covering a certain amount of area, uh, and we want to know how long that wave is hitting us, and that gives us uh, a more important uh, sense of the power of that wave. If the wave is moving out of a sphere, its intensity changes according to the inverse square law. Um, so we dealt with this in 151.2. So the area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. So here we can think about, you know, not necessarily, um, uh, this is really, we're imagining a kind of point mass here, but we can think of a larger sphere like the sun and think about, okay, well, what's the power of that uh, at a distance like, say, the radius of the Earth's orbit, um, which would be our r squared here, and that gives us our intensity. So that tells you something about the power of the sun, right? I mean, if r here is huge, uh, and our intensity is not tiny. You know, the sun still makes a substantial contribution uh, to our the energy of our world, uh, and so the overall power of that of the sun is is tremendous. But we knew that, right? So uh, the intensity of a wave is a function of the peak electric and magnetic fields. That's E naught and B naught, and we can write that in a ton of different ways. And this all comes from a relationship between that magnetic field and the electric field, right? So E naught is equal to B naught times C. Uh, and so we can basically take one of these and start fiddling with that and this equation, and we could get the other two uh, without too much trouble. The constants in that equation are the speed of light and the permittivity of free space, as well as the permeability of free space. And don't worry too much about that. We just want to know really that the amplitude of that wave and the amplitude of that magnetic field, um, the square of those is proportional to the intensity uh, and to the energy of the wave. That's our big point. We have a plot, a chart here of you know a whole bunch of different kinds of waves, and it's really useful to kind of look through this just to see, you know, the kind of different. I mean, we're familiar in some ways. We know what a microwave is because it heats up our uh, potatoes or whatever. Um, and we've heard, I think, of most of these, uh, but it's good to see what some of those are useful for. Um, 
because we saw how varied they were in frequency and wavelength. Some general rules that you can keep in mind as you move to the right on that spectrum towards high frequency and low wavelength. High frequency waves contain more energy. Um, so an X-ray contains more energy than a radio wave. High frequency waves can better penetrate matter, which is why um, the waves that are used in um, to try and figure out what's inside something, like an X-ray, uh, tend to be high frequency waves. Uh, they get they're less easily blocked by matter. Uh, high frequency waves carry more information per unit time. Uh, what does that mean? It means well, if you're trying to send information as a signal, um, then because it has more frequency, uh, you can change that information more quickly. Uh, and those wavelengths are smaller, and so you can actually resolve um, differences uh, more easily uh, visually with a high frequency wave. And a shorter wavelength uh, uh, can resolve more detail. So that was essentially what I was saying there. Um, these things are uh, closely related to each other. Okay, so that's our little introduction to EM waves. We'll get into the more uh, some of the more uh, interesting stuff I think uh, next time. Okay.